I'm Dave Mikkels of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I'm here with Svan Pabo of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. And we're talking about Neanderthal genetics. Welcome, Dr. Pabo. Thank you. Well, so who was Neanderthal and why are people so interested in him? Well, so Neanderthals were a group of humans that existed in Western Asia and Europe until they became extinct around 30,000 years ago. And they are fascinating, I think, because they are truly our closest evolutionary relatives. No other organism is as closely related to humans today as they were. So it's very fascinating to compare us to them because we can then really look at what is it that makes us unique compared to everyone else on this planet. And you're now involved in sequencing the entire set of genetic instructions mm -hmm. of Neanderthal. And what will those exact instructions, its genome, mm -hmm. tell us about us? So, well, so far we have the human genome, our own genome, and we have the genome of the chimpanzee, our closest living relative. So we could then find all the changes, all the features in our genome that have changed on the evolutionary lineage us since we shared a common ancestor with the chimps. But that's quite a long time ago, say five to seven million years ago when we will now have the genome of our closest relatives, the Neanderthal, we will be able to say what changed in our genome in the last little bit of human evolution, the last 300, 400,000 years, when fully modern humans appear for the first time. So these are then guys with a skeleton that's indistinguishable from ours. And among those genetic changes, we then hope that there will lie hints about what sets us apart. Such things that made human technology possible, that made art possible, that made it possible for us to colonize the entire planet. Great. Now, the first human genome took us 15 years to accomplish. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it will take to accomplish the Neanderthal genome? And where are you in that mm -hmm. process? So, at the moment where we are, we have worked two years seriously on this and we have a first very rough, rough draft of the genome so we can get a first overview. At the moment we are at the point where we have seen around 65% of the Neanderthal genome at least once. So we can sort of make windows and go over a Neanderthal chromosome and at least see more than half of the genetic information that is there. And we hope that we within the next two years will actually have almost all the genetic information. Now you mentioned that you'd like to see how we're similar or different to Neanderthal and similar or different to chimps. Could you give us an example mm -hmm. of a gene that we share with mm -hmm. Neanderthal but that we do not share mm -hmm. the same variation mm -hmm. with chimps? So one gene that we've been particularly interested in since a long time actually is a gene called FOXP2 and that's the only individual gene we know of today that has to do with language and speech ability in human. And we know that because if we have a mutation in human that knocks out one copy of this gene that we got from our mom or our dad, then we have a severe language problem and a speech problem, primarily about articulation, actually muscle control in the mouth and in the throat when we speak. And this gene is interesting because it has two changes in the protein it encodes that's specific to humans that you see in no other apes or monkeys. So we were very interested in looking in Neanderthals and see if this was something unique to modern humans or not. And somewhat to our surprise actually, it turned out that we share this with Neanderthals. Neanderthals look like, just like us with respect to this genetic change. So that then suggests that at least from the very little that we know about speech, there's no reason to assume that they couldn't articulate and speak as we do. That said, of course, we have to say there are lots of genes there that has to do with speech that we don't know yet where they could have differed. From, from the very tiny little thing we know today, there's no reason to assume they weren't like us. Now, your first experiment, mm. which you did more than 10 years mm. ago with Neanderthal DNA, worked with the mitochondrial chromosome, a very small chromosome. Why did you choose that to work with initially? So the mitochondrial DNA is particularly useful because it exists in many, many copies per our cell. So in every cell we have for a typical nuclear gene just two copies, one from our mom, one from our dad. 
the mitochondrial DNA, we have several hundred or even thousands of copies per cell, and they all come from our mother. But it's easier to retrieve in an ancient specimen just because there are more copies there. It also gives a picture that's easy to interpret of our genetic history, because as it's inherited only through the maternal side, so from my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, you sort of trace female history back in a very easy way. But it's of course just a tiny part of our entire genetic makeup. So now it's fascinating to be looking all over the genome. Now that initial experiment was important, um, and what did that experiment tell us that was really pretty critical? So what it showed was that for this part of our genome, for the mitochondrial genome, the Neanderthals fall outside of our variation. So whereas all humans on the planet in their mitochondrial DNA trace their ancestry back to a common ancestor between 100 and 200,000 years ago, the Neanderthal lineage goes back something like half a million years or a bit more. So this also showed that the Neanderthals then did not contribute any mitochondrial DNA to us today. So there was no indication that we mixed when we met from the mitochondrial DNA. Now, of course, we're in the process of analyzing the entire nuclear genome, and we might be able to pick up even a small contribution that may have happened. So in just a month or two, I think, we will be able to say much more about this. Now, of course, what you're touching on is sex. People mm -hmm. are always interested in sex, and the question is, during the time mm -hmm. we spent together mm -hmm. in Europe, mm -hmm. about 30,000 mm -hmm. years, our ancestors mm -hmm. and Neanderthal, did we ever mix it mm -hmm. up? And the question, it's an open question, mm -hmm. but do you think we'll be able to answer that question with certainty once we have the whole sequence? Well, I'd say like, as a geneticist, what I'm really interested in, did one have children back then? And did those children contribute to our variation today? I'm sure, in a way, that they had sex. But so what I'm interested in, was it productive in the sense giving offspring that contributed to us? And that I think we will be able to answer quite rigorously uh, with the genome sequence we'll have. Now you followed up on your earlier work with the mitochondrial chromosome by sequencing the entire mitochondrial chromosome from five or six mm -hmm. individuals. That was just within the last year. Mm -hmm. What did that experiment mm -hmm. tell you? So what we can then do is start studying the, how much variation there are among Neanderthals genetically in the mitochondrial genome and compare that to what we find in people living today to get a perspective. Was it a lot of variation? Was it little variation? And one fascinating thing in human variation is that when we compare ourselves to our closest living relatives, the great apes, we have quite little genetic variation which reflects that we go back to a rather small population in Africa that expanded around 100,000 years ago. Now, a big question was, are the Neanderthals like the apes in having a lot of variation or like us in having little variation? And the answer is very clear. They were like us in having little variation. And in fact, the variation seemed to be more on the scale of just Europeans or Asians today rather than humans worldwide. So it suggests that they also, just like us, probably have a history of where they went through bottlenecks, where there were few individuals around that then expanded again and had more offspring. Perhaps as a result of glaciations, they survived through at least three ice ages. Well, one final question. Once you have the whole Neanderthal sequence, would it be technically feasible to recreate a Neanderthal mm. in the flesh? Of course, this is Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. but maybe mm -hmm. a little easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, of course, speculate about technology that we don't even have today, right? Where one would say, in theory now, hypothetically, you would take a human embryo and replace, say, thousands and thousands of genetic variants and create the Neanderthal. Perhaps in a science fiction novel you could imagine that. It's also quite clear, I think, that it would be ethically totally sort of indefensible to do something like that. You would create a human being simply to satisfy your scientific curiosity, which is not something any responsible person would contemplate, I think. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, it's a pleasure. <laughs>